think we began our study under the subject enabled to forgive. In looking at the context of Matthew chapter 18, we see Peter asking Jesus a question. And that question was, how many times shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him until seven times? And Jesus answers Peter in verse 22 of Matthew chapter 18. And in Jesus's answer to Peter, Jesus goes beyond what Peter asked. Peter asked, shall I forgive until seven times? Jesus says, until 70 times seven. And then Jesus proceeds to teach on what God does when he forgives. So we want to establish God's concept of forgiveness. We want to know God's concept of forgiveness. We want to embrace God's concept of forgiveness. We want to apply God's concept of forgiveness in our lives. So Jesus gives this parable about a king who calls a particular servant to him and uh, he requires that the servant pay him. This servant owed an enormous amount of money. We learned this morning that one talent is 15 years of annual wages. This servant had 10,000 talents, meaning that he had 10,000 of the talents that were equivalent to 15 years of wages. So when you multiply uh, uh, 10,000 by uh, uh, 15 years, you'll find that this servant had in his possession uh, 150,000 years of annual wages. This was an in, uh, unconceivable amount. We can't imagine having 150 years of annual wages. Then uh, the servant who owed this enormous amount of money expected a prison sentence or something worse. And so he begins to plead, plead for patience, plead for mercy. And the king granted him more than what he asked for. He not only released him of his anger, he set the anger aside. Not only did he release him of the obligation to pay, he released him from the debt itself. Then the servant goes out and he finds a servant that owes him one denarii, one pence if you're reading the King James Version, one day labor, 150,000 years versus one day of wages. And uh, this servant that had been forgiven treats him the opposite of the way the king treated him. You would think that him experiencing this release, this joy, this freedom, this, this uh, presence before people of not owing anything, you would expect that this servant who had been forgiven would not act the way he acted toward the servant 
that owed him one day's work. But he acted the opposite of the way the king treated him. So the question becomes, why? Why is it that the king extended to him grace beyond his imagination, mercy beyond his imagination? He freed him from a debt that he could never pay. And this did not change this servant that had been forgiven. Is it possible that God has done great things for us? He showered grace and mercy upon us. He has been good and kind to us. He's given us things that we don't deserve. And yet we have not changed. So the question becomes, what enables one to be able to forgive? If we see this man experiencing the forgiveness he experienced and he was not able to forgive, then the question is, what enables a person to forgive? So this morning, we looked at two things. The first thing that we looked at is that your realization that you are forgiven enables you to forgive. If we don't remember that forgiveness connects us to God, if we don't remember that God has forgiven us, all of our past sins have been washed away in baptism. And now that we're in Christ Jesus, we have forgiveness of sin. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 through 7 then we're not able to forgive. Forgiveness is not enabled until we realize that we are forgiven. Then the second thing that we looked at this morning was that our denying Satan a foothold in our life enables us to forgive. Peter says, Lord, how many times shall I Forgive my brother until seven times. Well, Jesus says 70 times seven. In other words, don't stop forgiving. Why? Because if I stop forgiving, I'm going to give place to the devil. Ephesians chapter four and verse 26. Jesus says, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. When we stop laying aside anger, when we stop forgiving, when we limit our forgiving. You remember this morning we talked about that Jesus places no limit on the times you ought to forgive. And he does not place a limitation on the magnitude of the matter for which you are forgiving. He doesn't place any limits on that. Keep on forgiving. Why? Because if we don't lay aside, if we let the sun go down on our rent, we don't lay aside, we're giving the devil a foothold. And when we give the devil a place, when we give the devil a foothold, we then open ourselves to allowing the devil to influence our thought process, allowing the devil to influence our emotions, passions, and appetites. We allow the devil to uh, develop malice and bitterness and resentment within us. And all of these things are not the nature and the character of Jesus Christ. That we allow the devil to have a foothold we then make love withdrawals rather than love deposits. The core values of Jesus are not uh, the values that we use uh, to shape our attitude, uh, to determine what comes out of our mouth, to control and influence the way we think. Uh, the core values of Jesus will not be those determining factors when we let the devil have a foothold in our lives. Now, the third thing that we want to look at today is that forgiveness keeps God's power 
in perspective. Forgiveness keeps God's power in perspective. When we go back to the text, we see the servant that had been forgiven in his dealings with a servant that owed him. This servant that had been forgiven does something. He does something. What he does is he allows the small amount that the servant owed him to become bigger than the king who forgave him. Now let's look at it. The king forgave him of 10,000 talents. Didn't put him in prison. Did not sell his wife, nor his children, nor his possession. Didn't do any of that. And this servant owed him 10,000 talents, 150,000 years of wages. Wouldn't you say that that was an enormous amount to owe the king. Yet, this servant who had been forgiven, he captures a servant who owes him one pence, one denarii, one day's wages. And he becomes so engrossed, he becomes so angry he beats him and puts him in prison. Just like, just like the king laid aside his anger. He should have laid aside his anger, but he didn't. He beat him. He threw him in prison. The servant did not pay the unforgiving servant but what the servant did not pay will never be greater than the debt he owed the king. The servant that owed the one day's wage, nothing to pay. But when you look at the size that the servant that owed the forgiven servant's debt versus the forgiven servant's debt, there's a vast difference. That's a vast difference. The servant did not pay the unforgiving servant, but the servant didn't, the per servant did not pay what the servant rather did not pay will never ever be greater than the debt the unforgiving servant owed the king. And will never have the impact that the king's forgiveness had on the unforgiving servant. Never, never. The king had an impact, but the unforgiving servant will never have the impact on the servant that owed him that the king had on forgiving that servant of 10,000 talents. Now, let's think. Someone may steal from you. Someone may stop loving you. Someone may insult you. Someone may abuse you, but they will never be able to destroy the love that God has for you or his rule over all that concerns him. Now watch this. When the unforgiving servant punished the servant that owed him one day's wages. The impact of the king's forgiveness didn't just affect the servant forgiven. It, affect, it affected individuals around him. So what happens when the unforgiving servant did not forgive bystanders? Those who knew the situation. You remember he talked about how he can now walk the streets and folk don't know him as a debtor. They know him as a free man. 
So bystanders who know him, they go back to the king and tell the king what happened. They knew him. And the king's forgiveness had an impact on them. The king's forgiveness was so great that those who stood by believed that the unforgiving servant should have been able to. It's an interesting thing how that some individuals can look on to our situation and see what should happen. And we ourselves are in the very midst of the situation and we can't see or we refuse to see. So do you see how the king's forgiveness had an impact? It not only impacted the servant that was forgiven, it affected those around, those who knew him, those who knew the situation. God's redeeming love is bigger than our enemies. So, so if someone steals from me, if someone stops loving me, if someone insults me, if someone abuses me, that person will never be able to destroy the love that God has for me. That person will never be able to destroy God's rule over all that concerns him. If I am his concern, what a person does against me cannot destroy God's concern for me. I'm, let me say that again. What a person does to you can never destroy God's concern for you. You remember the Apostle Paul acts in Romans chapter 8 around verse number 34. He says, who is he that condemns or condemneth us? He says, it is God that justifies. Understand that Satan, a person doing you wrong, a wrong situation, cannot destroy God's concern for you. This is what Joseph acknowledged after his brothers threw him in a pit, sold him into slavery. You remember in Genesis 15, verse 20, Joseph says what Satan meant for evil, God meant for good. No matter what a person does against you, no matter what wrong affects you, that does not control and it cannot control what God means, what God wills and what God providentially does in our lives for his glory. Think about something someone has done to you that has demanded forgiveness. Question, do you believe that God is bigger than the wrong? Are you convinced that God's love and his rule his values, his will, his word redeems you. Someone does you wrong. Do we believe that God's love and his rule, his will, his word redeems us? Are we convinced of that? If we are convinced, if we believe that God is bigger then the wrong, then what do we do? We lay aside the anger. We lay aside the anger. I think about driving on the interstate and here's a car, he's speeding in uh, tight traffic. Many of you may have seen an individual rev the engine or, or scream the tires or floor their gas pedal in a tight section of cars. And because it's really not worth, it's really not valuable to me 
to act the same way he acts, I can slow down. I can even stop and let him go on. I can lay aside any uh, motion to get ahead, any motion to go for I can lay that aside and let him or let her, whatever the ginger of the driver is, let them go ahead. The same thing can be applied to anger. If I believe that God is bigger than the wrong, I can lay that aside. And when I lay that aside, I do three things that we talked about this morning. I become honest about the reason for my anger. I see God's solution for my dilemma. And I lay my anger aside for my betterment. When, when I am persuaded, when I am convinced that God is bigger, that enables me to lay my anger aside. I want to encourage all of us from the pulpit to the back door. Stop thinking that somebody has ruined your life and that you will never recover. Why should I stop thinking that? You should stop thinking that because God is your redeemer. God is my redeemer. You remember this morning we said I am redeemed. I'm bought with a price. Jesus has changed my life. If anybody asks you just who I am, tell him that I am redeemed. That's who I am. So I can't allow anybody to ruin my life. I can't allow this thinking that I will never recover to be that pattern of thinking as I approach life from day to day, I won't do it. Some individuals are doing it, but the child of God resolves, I will not do it. Why? Because God is my redeemer. Listen to Psalms 138 and verse number eight. There the psalmist writes through the power of the Holy Spirit, the Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the work of thine own hands. Somebody wrongs me. Something wrong happens to me. Something wrong happens around me. I become a victim of somebody else's wrong. Whatever the case is, it's not bigger than my Redeemer. The psalmist says, the Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Wrongs occur. We lay aside anger because we know that the Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Our faith says, the Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Someone insults me. Someone abuses me. Someone steals from me. Someone hurts me. Whatever the case is, the Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Now, what do I do? I continue to apply myself. How do I apply myself? I remember that God is a gracious God. He's a merciful God. The wrong cannot outlive God because God is from everlasting to everlasting. God does not forsake the works of his hand. God is not interested. God has never been interested and God never will be interested in allowing his creation to be less of something other than what he created it to be. On each day of creation, God says the evening and the morning was the first, second, or third 
for a fifth, sixth day, and it was good. At the end of the creation, in uh, Genesis chapter 1, he saw his creation, that it was very good. God doesn't want you and me to be nothing less than very good. Your perspective that God is more powerful than the wrong done against you and or the people who have wronged you enables you to forgive. The king is much more angry when we look back at the text about the servant's lack of forgiveness. And I don't know if you've ever caught this. The king is much more angry about the servant's lack of forgiveness for a fellow servant than about his sin against the king. You see, when the king brought him to put before him, you owe me 10,000 talents. When the servant pleaded and asked for mercy, the king forgave him. He didn't say, oh, no, I've given you an opportunity to pay, but you have not paid. So now it's punishment time. King didn't say that. But when the king heard about how the servant he forgave would not forgive the servant that owed him less than what he owed the king, the king was very angry. He was more angry. How do you know he was more angry? Because he threw him into prison. He was more angry. There was no pleading and, oh, I won't treat him like that anymore. Off to punishment, you go. That's what he did. Those who have been forgiven must forgive. Those who have been forgiven must forgive. Can you now visualize Jesus saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and watch this. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Jesus teaches his disciples to pray for forgiveness. And when we pray for forgiveness, we pray asking for forgiveness as we forgive others. Do we just pray that God will forgive us? Or do we pray that God forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, believing that those who have been forgiven must forgive? Should we ever be so angry with each other in the body that we do not forgive? No, we should not. Should there ever be a situation where we cannot forgive? No, it should not. Why? Because those who have been forgiven must forgive. A Christian husband, Christian wife, should there ever be a time when they cannot forgive? No. Christian parents, bringing the children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Should there ever be a time when a parent can't forgive a child and a child can't forgive a parent? No, it should not. When we let love abide, should there ever be a time in the body that we can't forgive? No, it should not. Why? Because those who have been forgiven must forgive. If I worship God every first day of the week, I must forgive. If I honor Jesus as my Savior who has forgiven me, I must forgive. 
If I partake of the Lord's Supper, if I read my Bible, if I pray to the Lord, I must forgive because I'm functioning as one forgiven. And those who have been forgiven must forgive. That's what Jesus is teaching. So this evening, if there's anything going on that's causing us to be angry, let's set it aside. Let's set it aside. And remember that forgiveness connects us to the Lord. Failure to forgive allows Satan to have influence in our lives. And forgiveness keeps God's power in perspective. Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. There's no person, no situation, no thing that's more powerful than God. All power belongs to God. If you're here this evening and that hasn't been your mindset, rededicate your life to Jesus by repentance, confession, and prayer. If you're not a Christian, this is a perfect time for you to become a Christian. Believe that Jesus died for your sin. He was buried. He rose again the third day. The blood is shed at Calvary. Purchased the church of God. The Church of Christ, Acts 20, verse 28, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Mark 16, 15 and 16. Believing the gospel moves you to repent, to resolve, to come to the conclusion, to make up your mind that your life is going to change to a life that glorifies God. Now, in order to do that, you must believe that God is right about everything. Acts 2 and verse 38 confess Jesus, that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. Acts 8 37. We will baptize you and in baptism your sins are washed away. Acts 2 and verse 38. Acts 22 and verse 16 the Lord adds you to his church. Acts 2 and verse 47 he adds you to the church of Christ. Romans 16 and verse 16. We pray that God will bless each of us to make the changes in our lives that will bring glory to his name. If there's anyone who would like to respond, we certainly give you this opportunity after we sing a verse of a song. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Oh, the angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore.